Thank you very much. It's a, a great honor for me to give a presentation uh, on this occasion. Um, when I sent off uh, the title uh, for this talk, The Appeal of Quantum Gases, I was, of course, thinking um, of, well, how wonderful things you can do with quantum gases. When I looked at the title a week ago or so again and was reflecting on the appeal of quantum gases, I realized it is actually not just that quantum gases are such nice materials. Um, it is also, and, and that's maybe even the greater appeal of it, it is a wonderful uh, community to work in. And these last 30 years or so in, in this field, it, um, the, it, I could enjoy, and I think many, many colleagues could enjoy this um, openness, this spirit of inclusiveness, this joint endeavor to, to do research, but to do it in a very, very uh, positive spirit. And if you think of that, where does a positive spirit come from? Usually it comes from somewhere. And often it comes um, from the previous uh, generation of uh, researchers. They somehow are able to imprint uh, this uh, spirit. And there is another aspect where the quantum gas, in particular in Europe, Europe could profit a lot. It was it started off, it took off more or less at the same time when all the European uh, programs took off. And so we could profit from all these arrangements and um, could, I think, we, we, we did make uh, the best out of it. We took them as granted. We took them as they, they are simply there, they have to be there. But that is not the case. Of course, again, a previous generation had to do the work that the next generation could have uh, such a good uh, situation uh, to do research. So for me, it's a bit of a thank you um, to um, those people who have helped. And um, Alfred Kastler, his spirit surely has contributed a lot uh, to what, what conditions we have now. So we should appreciate them. It's really a treasure. OK, so, so but there was also this other aspect um, about the quantum gases. Um, what I like about quantum gases, and I think why they are nice, is they are, on the one hand, a system which is at the forefront of conceptual understanding in physics, but at the same time, you can do experiments almost with the precision of a uh, typical atom AMO type of uh, experiments. And this combination has proved to be extremely fruitful. So one, one question might be, where is the physics in, in quantum gases? So the physics in quantum gases is in the low energy sector. It is in the kinetic energy of the atoms, it is in the collisions, it is in spin ordering, in density uh, excitations. It's not in the electronic excitations. It's in the very low energy sector. <coughs> one could, looking back over the, the last 30 years, one, one, one might be tempted to draw a map like this, you, you have the Bose-Einstein condensates, you have uh, the Fermi gases uh, pioneered by uh, late Debbie Chin, and uh, you have uh, strongly interacting bosonic systems like MOT insulator and uh, the BEC-BCS crossover, and then you might think, oh, okay, that's it. Um, but I would like to argue, no, that's not it. It's, um, we, we have, many more opportunities and it goes much deeper than this uh, little picture uh, suggests. So in general, we can look at these many body systems in a simple Hamiltonian. We can take a many body Hamiltonian with some kinetic energy, with interactions and with some form 
of trap. And let me briefly walk you through these three terms. Um, the first term, the kinetic energy, of course, we can change this energy. OK, we can modify it uh, using uh, optical standing waves, uh, producing band structures and energy gaps. So this is, however, just a picture of uh, an energy versus momentum. Yet, in physics, you, of course, also have wave functions with, with a phase. And you can get to situations which are uh, more complex and where you have uh, phases or berry phases that you can uh, accumulate if you say go round, for example, uh, such a Dirac point. And so this gives rise to some sort of topology. And in cold atoms, you can also go to a situation where you go to even uh, non-trivial uh, topologies, for example, where you only have one uh, Dirac point left. And that is one of the examples I will have a closer look at. So that is playing around basically with the kinetic uh, energy of the system. Let's move uh, to the interaction. The interaction between the atoms is dominated in most experiments by uh, the collisional uh, contact interaction. And a good example is that if you have repulsive interaction, if they're strong enough, they will suppress density fluctuations. And for example, you can get create mod insulating states. Or also, uh, you can create um, antiferromagnetic uh, ordering. Very ni recent nice work had come out with the ma microscopes. But you could also think, OK, where, where can one go with the interaction. And I think an important point here are long-range interactions. And I will discuss with you a, an example where there is an, a model system is created which is governed both by short-range and by long-range interactions. And this combination will give rise uh, to a, a lattice supersolid and we will also see how you can create a super solid breaking a continuous symmetry. And the last term we have, that is uh, the term that all, all the gases are always trapped in a, typically in a harmonic trapping potential, but uh, the technology moves on and the inventiveness. Um, there are uh, uh, flat bottom traps also here at ENS. Um, and uh, you can have uh, ring traps, uh, for example, NIST. And I would like, in this direction, move on um, to a situation where you can think of really creating uh, devices out of your uh, quantum gases. And there I will discuss a little device, maybe the most simple device, quantum device that you can think of that is a quantum point contact uh, with atoms. And I will only briefly discuss this, but my feeling is there is a lot of future in uh, creating uh, these device-like uh, structures. Let me start with the way how we build our Hamiltonians uh, to investigate, for example, non-trivial uh, band structure effects. So the starting point is that we take a quantum gas of potassium-40, it's cooled to, it's a fermionic quantum gas cooled uh, to uh, quantum degeneracy, and we load it into an optical lattice potential, as is done in, in many other uh, laboratories. And when, when I think of a a Hamiltonian, or typically this is a Hubbard Hamiltonian. When I think of how does a Hubbard Hamiltonian look like, uh, that's what, what it looks like. Um, this is a picture from, from the lab, of course. Um, and you see within this shiny box there in the center, there's a glass cell. And inside this glass cell, there is this uh, quantum gas trapped. And you have 
perpendicular standing waves, one going in this direction, one in this direction, and another is coming uh, from the top. Um, since in what I will talk about, we basically look at the kinetic energy term, it's enough to have some simple measurement technique. And the measurement techniques we use, that is a, a time of flight of the adiabatically expanded uh, uh, standing wave. And so basically what you do, you load your gas into the standing wave and then you adiabatically switch off and let it expand and then you take a picture of the real space distribution but which reflects the quasi-momentum distribution here in the lowest band and uh, this in the higher band. That is actually a technique which goes back uh, to, to Bill Phillips' lab, um, still in the time um, of cold atoms. But this gives you, the important point is here, it gives you an, an image of what the quasi-momentum distribution in your band is. Um, and let's also go to a simple structure. And this simple structure, what we want to look at is, is the, the hexagonal lattice of graphene, but we don't want to have it just statically. We'll start off statically, but we want to see what is happening when we, when we uh, let it rotate uh, periodically, as was shown here. When, when we were thinking about implementing some graphene type of work, then we first thought, oh, this is not a good idea at all because you have this 120 degree angle. There is no chance to, to, to implement that in our experiment. I've shown you a picture. I mean, there, there, there was no way for 120 degree angles. And, and then in a way, we, we could, the only thing we could do is watch what other people were doing. And they did very nice work um, doing, looking at Dirac points in, in 1D situations, creating honeycomb lattices and also Kagome lattices, just some examples. And we felt a bit, not depressed, but a little bit left outside. However, in, in, in science, you should not never be too, uh, too frustrated. And uh, even though you might be a bit annoyed sometimes and tear on the things. And then um, you may realize um, here that if you stretch the graphene lattice, you do, will not change the topology. In particular, will, you will not, for symmetry reason, you will not change the fact that you have Dirac points. And indeed, in theory, people very often when they study the properties of graphene, they actually look at a brick lattice. And th that was pointed out to us. And that was at a time when we were setting up a lattice of a tunable geometry. And the basic idea of that lattice is that you produce, you overlay two interference pattern of, two, of uh, two sets of laser beams. So the red beams and here this brown beam. And then you can play with this overlaying this interference pattern. And what you then realize is that you can get just by changing one intensity, you can create checkerboard pattern, dimer, 1D chains triangle lattice, and in particular also honeycomb lattice, one of these brick type of honeycomb lattice, and a square lattice. And this honeycomb lattice, um, that should have Dirac points. And maybe, I mean, coming from atom optics, you wonder, so why, why what's special about the Dirac points? I mean, why, why does it have uh, uh, Dirac points? And actually, I think there's a quite a simple way how one can convince oneself that there must be Dirac points if I take this red lattice, these two interfering beams which produce this structure in real space and the corresponding band structure with band gaps. Okay, so that's the starting point. And now you can wonder if I add, and that's what we do in the experiment, we just add a single standing laser wave, which is shifted uh, by uh, a, a half a period, so that the minima are on the maxima of the other standing wave. So why should that give rise to uh, Dirac points? And the argument is 
that if you find, I mean, in the, in the underlying band structure, you have some, of course, the, the, your bands give your, you your eigenstates. And if your, the standing wave you add has at some points the same eigenstates, then that means it will not mix those eigenstates. Okay, so that's a good starting point if the second standing wave doesn't mix the eigenstates. And now the question is, does, imagine you are at a band gap, they don't mix, and does, do, does the AC Stark shift shift those two states differently? And yes, that you can arrange, that the higher one is shifted stronger to lower energies than the lower one, and then they have to cross at some point. And that's how um, this Dirac point in the intuitive picture uh, comes about. And here is uh, the calculation, what it looks like in our situation. So for measuring Dirac points, the situation is difficult. Um, it's not exactly experimentally stream. You have a vanishing density of states and small energy scales. Vanishing density of states means no signal, basically, there's nothing there. Small energy scales means infinite measurement times. So we did try different things, but we came back uh, to, to a method which was actually invented here uh, in Christoph Salomon's labs, and these are uh, Bloch oscillations and then looking at interband transitions. Okay, the starting point, the idea is you take your whole cloud and then you accelerate it through your, uh, through your band structure by applying a magnetic field gradient. And in the normal case, if there are no Dirac points, then you would expect to see uh, Bloch oscillations. However, if the cloud passes or the atoms have a momentum trajectory passing through a Dirac point, they will tr be transferred uh, to the higher band. And as I've shown you earlier on, we can measure the populations in the lower and higher bands. And here you can see such a, oops, such a Bloch oscillation evolve, evolving in time, and also now you see here the transfer uh, to the higher bands. And here is the population now in the higher bands, and here the population is missing in the lower bands, which is an indication of these Dirac points. We could also then see that we get different results um, when we accelerate in the vertical direction or in the, uh, in, the, in the horizontal or the vertical direction through this lattice structure as a function, and these are the plots, as a function of intensities of the lattices. And this dashed line, that's the point where the Dirac point, the line where the Dirac points appear. Here we have a region where the lattice structure hasn't got Dirac points, here it has Dirac points. And depending on in which direction we go through, we see at the point where the Dirac points appear a very rapid increase in the number of, of transferred atoms, and here a very slow decrease. And this shows us that we can distinguish between a linear crossing or a quadratic touching. In this case, in the vertical direction, there we have a, at this line, we have only a quadratic touching. So we have a low trans, very low transfer, because it would stay adiabatically on the lowest state. And here we have a linear crossing, and that gives a high efficiency transfer. OK, so you can play around. So you have this graphene type of lattice, and now you can start to play around. And one question is, of course, what, what is happening if you break inversion symmetry? If you break inversion symmetry, then you're directly confronted with the question of uh, the Berry phase. I mean, you, you see, you break up here your, um, your Dirac point, and now uh, um, the, the Berry curvature is no, now no longer confined to the Dirac point, but it will spread out here in the band structure. And that has consequences on the semi-classical motion of the atoms, and that was pointed out by Nigel Cooper. So if you now imagine, again, you take your cloud, move it through the situation where you have just slightly open Dirac points, then you expect 
that at the Dirac points, due to the Berry curvature, the atoms get a, 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 a transverse uh, drift. They acquire transverse drift at one Dirac point to the right, at the other Dirac point to the, to the left. Because at those two Dirac points, the Berry curvature has different signs. So one could argue, OK, a little drift to the left, a little drift to the right, that will cancel out. Well, that's almost the case. And you will not see anything. But you could also now question what would actually happen if you had the same Berry curvature at both Dirac points. Then you would get a drift to the right and another drift to the right. And that very much reminds one of a, a Hall effect. It's very much like a, a Hall current. And the, the question is only, um, can you create a band structure with two slightly open Dirac points where the Berry curvature is the same? And um, here we were lucky that uh, people <laughs> before us had thought about that problem. And that was uh, Duncan Haldane, who in the late 80s had a proposal on how to create a quantum Hall effect without a magnetic field. So the starting point for this uh, reasoning was a, a honeycomb lattice with its uh, two Dirac points. And then he realized that it's not the magnetic field which is most important, it's the breaking of time reversal symmetry. So he was really thinking on the question, what does breaking of time reversal symmetry, what, which consequences will that have on uh, the band structure and then the classification of my system? And he implemented, and as a theorist you can, of course, implement time uh, breaking of time reversal symmetry, he implemented it by adding some complex coupling between next nearest neighbors, these red lines. So these have some, some tunneling matrix element and some uh, non-zero phase. And then he can also play, he could play around with breaking time reversal symmetry and breaking inversion symmetry. And uh, he could see that if he breaks um, the time reversal symmetry, then he opens up gaps, gets an insulator, but a special type of insulator, a churn insulator, which still um, has a finite, uh, which shows a Hall conductance, a non-zero Hall conductance. Okay, so by additionally um, breaking time reversal symmetry, he could obtain such a phase diagram. Let's have a bit closer look at this phase diagram. So what's plotted here along the horizontal direction, that is the phase, the breaking of time reversal symmetry. So that's the phase in this next nearest neighbor coupling. So here, when you go away from zero, you break time reversal symmetry. And if you go away here from zero, you break inversion symmetry by changing the relative uh, lattice, sub lattice offset. So here, this is the graphene situation, different Berry curvature at the points. If you go away, you, you, you open up gaps, you, you get an insulator, but uh, different Berry curvatures. However, if you go into, uh, if you just break time reversal symmetry, then again, you open up a gap, but now uh, the Berry curvature remains the same. And now the question is, what is happening if you go and if you now in, in the, add some inversion symmetry, what's happening if you add inversion symmetry, you have these two open gaps, then one of the gaps closes and then it touches at the point where this line is and then it opens again but with the, with the sign of the Berry curvature changed. And that's uh, how this phase diagram uh, now shows uh, or the, where, where the lines of these phase diagrams are determined and here you have the churn insulators and here you have uh, normal insulators. And the question then was, was how, how can you realize that? He himself, he wrote, 
while the particular model presented here is unlikely to be directly physically realizable, it indicates that at least in principle the quantum Hall effect can be placed in the wider context of phenomena associated with broken time uh, reversal symmetry. Um, how to implement it? There a proposal from Oka in Hideo Aoki uh, came out and and, and this, in this proposal, they showed um, that if you rotate the lattice, then you can create, using Floquet theory, an effective Hamiltonian, which is exactly uh, the one uh, of Holden. And he, he was, in that proposal, he was thinking about, OK, you rotate. You shine, you have graphene, now you shine on uh, a light, circular polarized light, and then you can switch on and off uh, a, a whole, uh, whole effect. In the lattice experiment, it's fairly straightforward to implement, in particular since um, the pioneering work of Ennio Arimondo on lattice shaking system. So what we do is we shake the lattice with the two mirrors, and then, um, we, we, and on both sides, and we can now shake either in phase or we can shake out of phase. And if we shake out of phase, we get this circular uh, orientation. And that way, we can create, in both cases shaking, we can create either a trivial band insulator or a churn insulator. Um, so here, what we then measured is the drift of our atomic cloud, and either we accelerate, uh, so what we do is we accelerate upwards, and then we accelerate downwards, and we look at the uh, detected difference in the center of mass position. And here you can see the situation for the topologically trivial situation, so there is no difference in the drift. And whilst in the uh, situation where we have a broken time uh, reversal symmetry, um, where we break time reversal symmetry, we can see the corresponding drift either in the one or in the other direction. And we can also make a whole map of this situation, where in, in for which configurations we get which drift. But now we can also ask the question, can we actually get the phase diagram that, that, that Haldane had proposed? And the idea here is the following, that as I explained to you earlier, at the borders of this phase, one of this Dirac point closes. And we have a method to measure whether uh, Dirac points uh, can close, and that was in this time of flight images. So now what we did is we measured for a given parameter how many atoms are transferred to the higher band at the lower or at the higher Dirac point. And this gives us the information of this, where there's the maximum, it gives us the information on the phase diagram. And that phase diagram is now shown here. Again, breaking of time reversal symmetry, and here the drift, uh, the, 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 uh, the breaking of the um, sub, sub lattice offsets inversion symmetry. And the points are the measurements, and the different lines are depending up on ab initio, the, the range of our ab initio uh, parameters. So we, we get a very good agreement here. So let me now move on to a slightly different topic, and that topic is now related to the interactions in quantum gases. So we have seen um, that we, we, and we all know we are familiar with the short-range interactions, but what about long-range interactions? And in particular, I want to talk about long-range interactions and supersolidity. So long-range interaction is quite a, a big goal and, and desire in the uh, community, and there are, is a lot of work on dipolar molecules and atoms, on Rydberg atoms, and the, what I will talk about is about cavity-mediated interactions. And the 
it, it might not be immediately obvious why super solidity comes in here, but uh, you will see in a moment. Super solidity is a concept where you have a crystallization of a many body system and at the same time a dissipationless flow of its constituents. So let's have a look here. Um, th this might be what you think of what a super solid is. So it solidifies in a density pattern and at the same time this density pattern can easily move, uh, move along. So you will see that is not immediately obvious how to achieve that. And that's why I will start uh, with a, a lattice super solid. So the idea here is that you break a discrete symmetry. Okay, and you need to think of a bose hubbard model of a system with short range interaction, just hopping atoms. And they are, uh, this model is inside a cavity which acts off resonantly on the atoms. And you will see how it acts in the, in the next slide. Imagine this is your bose hubbard model and now you shine light from the side on this structure. And if the atoms have a distance of lambda over two, well, there will be only forward scattered light, even though there's a cavity around. So here's a cavity around. Okay, now if you imagine that uh, you remove some of these atoms, e e all the odd sides, then uh, you, you get the feeling, okay, there will be light, there are bright planes and light will be scattered into the cavity, okay? Of course, you could just put the atoms on the, the, not on the even, but on the odd sides. Okay, but so okay, again, you can pl print the bright planes. Okay, so now what is happening if you start off with such a density pattern, imagine it's, it's a periodically modulated, a superfluid in a lattice, and you increase the power of this uh, beam from the side. If you increase further, at some point the system realizes it is energetically favorable to have light field in the cavity and producing such a additional standing wave. So the AC Stark shift wins over the amount of kinetic energy that you have to bring up to uh, create the density ripple. So this is a phase transition from a, uh, a f where you change the density order uh, in within a superfluid state. And we can measure that directly in the experiment by measuring the output from the cavity. So once we see output from the cavity, we know that's directly our measure of our order parameter of, of this density ripple that forms uh, spontaneously. So for example, this is a trace. And at the same time, we can also measure the superfluid order parameter in the usual way of the sharp momentum peaks. And this gives us in total a phase diagram that's shown here, fairly, fairly complex phase diagram since you now have short and long range competing order. So you have a superfluid phase, you have this lattice super solid. When it loses superfluidity, it is a, a charge density wave and you also have the usual mod insulator transition. But you might argue, well, that is not the real thing. Well, there's, there are a lot, a lot of literature on, on uh, lattice, um, uh, super solid, so, but, but what about really being able, um, having a, a continuous symmetry broken? And to break a continuous symmetry, the, the, the toolbox of cold atoms, you can actually come up with a trick how you can do that with two cavities. At first, two cavities, you think, okay, it just will give me two of these discrete symmetry broken phases. Well, that is what it does at first, but let's have a look at the phase diagram. Here, what you see here, there, this, this is a coupling along the two axes. Well, the two axes are coupling to one and the other cavity. And if it's red, then you have organization in one cavity. And if it's 
uh, yellow, you have organization in the other cavity. So you can organize in the one cavity or in the other cavity. That's kind of the same story as before. But then you can also ask the question, what is actually happening on the line between where you couple the coupling strengths between on those two cavities is, is the same. So this is this along this line and this line, okay? And we can do that experimentally. We can go into this region where we have same coupling. And there we actually see that we have a field. We have a field in both uh, cavities. Okay, so how, uh, how does that uh, come about and what does that mean? Let's have a look here. What, 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 uh, so why can that bring us a continuous symmetry? So now if you just think about a sample of atoms inside a cavity, and now you imagine, and, and then you have the second cavity, and now you imagine, does it cost energy to move a photon from one cavity into the other cavity? If there's the same coupling strengths, it may not cost any energy, okay? And if you can achieve that also in a situation where you take into account the external degrees of freedom, then you have a situation where you break a, a continuous symmetry because you can now think of the two fields, uh, the field strengths in one cavity, field strengths in the other cavity, and if it doesn't change any energy, you can move the field from one cavity into the other cavity continuously. And this phase here where you move is, uh, is your continuous phase. And if you now go back into real space, then you realize that shifting the intensity from one, the field from one cavity to the other, that uh, continuously shifts uh, your interference pattern, your self-established interference pattern. And then, you, if you wrap up this phase diagram, um, you can see that this phase in the middle is, has the structure of a Mexican hat. And the measurement that we had here where we were, went into both phases, um, you can translate into uh, such a wiggling of, uh, your, uh, of the phase, a direct measurement of the in situ position of those atoms. Okay, so I will come uh, to an end. I will, the last point that I would like uh, to draw your attention, but I will not go into detail is, but where I see a lot of uh, future is to create something like that. You see, you, you have a two reservoirs for atoms. It's li almost like uh, in, in mesoscopic physics. And then you can do a transport through a region where you create, when you could create something with a non-trivial topology or you could, could create certain interactions in this region. And, um, and then you can measurements on, do measurements, transport measurements on the samples and you have very low energy probes using the atoms from the reservoir. So just to show you our main experiments that we had done so far, so we start off with very good optical access uh, in, the, in the experiment. And then we have an elongated cloud which we split into two using laser beams. Then we can produce more atoms on the one side than on the other side. That's our Fermi battery. And then we can measure how we transport from one reservoir to the other. The next step was then to structure this region. And the most simple structure one can think of is a quantum point contact. And indeed, we could observe in the quantum point contact, uh, we could observe uh, quantization of the conductance. So the conductance, of course, we infer from our decaying current between the two uh, reservoirs. And where, where the challenges will be, this is really when you go to strongly correlated superfluids. And there are some regions uh, which we can now enter, which are difficult or not accessible for mesoscopic 
physicists. For example, well, they, they, they cannot, in strongly correlated systems, apparently it's very difficult to produce quantum point contacts. We can go there and we can measure as a function of here a control parameter which changes our uh, chemical potential and we see highly non-linear characteristics and we can measure these non-linear um, uh, current bias relations. So this is just briefly flashing it on. It's basically the mechanism which produces the current is um, multiple Andreev reflection processes. The, the, our biggest surprise that we had and that was the, the biggest puzzle I, I think I encountered in, in this cold atoms business so far, is when we went to attractive interactions not on resonance, a bit further away. And that, that were the last three slides. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, um, that, and there we could see that the conductance, while it has for weak interactions a plateau at one, it increases this plateau beyond one. And that is puzzling because the idea behind the conductance plateau is basically a Pauli principle and Heisenberg. And as long as you have a Fermi liquid, it should work. And there shouldn't be higher conductance. But we saw higher conductance, even going above two. Two you could still argue with having pairing. And you had a shoulder even higher. And of course, on the resonance, it turns superfluid. And so this question we, we discussed with other people, in particular with Leonie Klassmann and, and, uh, and Eugene uh, Demmler, and they came up, in particular uh, Martin, um, he came up with an idea that it might be, the, the, the ba basic point I show, so your basic point is that inside the channel, um, due to the one-dimensionality, you have a, a, a higher TC. So you can be superfluid inside the channel whilst being normal outside. And now the question is, for, your, for the whole problem, how big is the super sol, uh, superfluid region? If it's small, it couples maybe to one transverse channel. If it's larger, it can couple to more transverse channel. And that way you can explain higher and higher uh, uh, conductance. So that's one, there are other people giving other explanations. But with this, I would like uh, to come to the last slide. And this is again a slide which um, for me is the appeal of quantum gases and that's to work with these people. And it's such great uh, pleasure to work with them. And for, just for fun, I, um, I underlined in this slide those people who had also worked here uh, in the Paris area or had education from the Paris area. And I, I would just like to mention them. Um, that is uh, Rémi Debicois, who is working on the, on the lattice experiment. There's Jean-Philippe Brantu. Sebastian Griner had been in um, Jean's lab. Uh, Martin Lebra, he studied at the Ecole Polytechnique. Laura Corman did a uh, PhD with um, um, Jean, uh, Jean Dalibar, Charles uh, Grenier, he worked with Antoine Georges, and Julian Leonhardt also had been in Jean Dalibar's lab. So it's really a great pleasure with, to work with all of them and to interact in this community. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Tillman, for that, uh, that exciting uh, description of some of the latest uh, work. Um, if I could ask a question first, uh, I wanted to ask about this um, uh, uh, Hall effect in, in where you broke the time symmetry by, by rotating the lattice in, in sort of the spirit of Haldane. And I think you'll, you'll agree that sort of similar to the work that, that Ian Spielman did breaking it in a different way, that what was observed was really a classical Hall effect. Now, what I'm wondering is, what do you have to do to make it quantum? <laughs> I, I think you can, uh, I, I would slightly phrase, ah, phrase okay. it differently. I would phrase it differently. I was also, of course, I mean, you could argue, okay, it would be nice uh, to see also, say, an edge state or something that you can do. I think what we've shown, and I think that's true probably for a lot of the different work, um, what we show is we 
probe the nature of the band structure. We, we, yeah. we, we saw some characteristics, not all of them, so the edge states we did not see, but all, basically all the other characteristics of this band structure. Um, to probe a Hall effect, I think, um, as a real quantum Hall effect, kind of real measurement of a quantum Hall effect, I, I would, there I would go uh, to device-like structure. I would put a little, a nicely um, time reversal breaking little device um, structure between um, the two reservoirs yeah. and then measure uh, the, 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 the whole right. uh, voltage. And yeah. I think that should work. Yeah. Right. And should. so I think that'll be an exciting. <laughs> would, would be nice. Uh, I yeah. also I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do we have uh, other questions? Yes, here. I have a physics uh, question also. Um, so single uh, layer uh, graphene or boron nitride, they have these peculiar absorption properties that uh, light uh, going perpendicular to such a sheet is absorbed uh, at alpha pi uh, independently of wavelengths. I was wondering if something similar along these lines uh, can be also observed for uh, single layer uh, at atomic structures in such lattices. Well, I guess the if, if I translate it directly with light, then I would say probably not. However, I would now try to think on, you see, uh, um, if I now translate, say, maybe a lattice shaking of a certain sort with the light, um, then maybe yes, but it would need more thinking. Um, I'm going to take a, the chairman's prerogative and ask Jean Dalibar to comment on that question. So uh, if you could bring a... <laughs> yes, uh, it's a very interesting question. What is the absorption, maximal absorption of an atomic monolayer? So in graphene, as you say, it's alpha pi and it's broadband. So you can ask the same question with atoms which are all equivalent and say, OK, I make a monolayer of atoms and what is the maximal absorption? And uh, so there is a kind of universal answer too, but we don't know how to express it in terms of fundamental constant. That is, we don't know about alpha, but typically the answer is about two. The optical thickness is around two. That is, when you put more and more atoms, then they get out of resonance because of van der Waals interaction, so they stop being, in, uh, be, being uh, absorbing light. So there is indeed a maximum like for graphene. Thank you. But, but now then I need to ask, is there anything about the structure of graphene in that? I mean, in your answer... My answer is a disordered it's gas, a, yes, like exactly. the electrons in graphene. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, and that you have also, it's not the peculiarity of the structure of graphene, most likely. Okay, well, there will be a break. Huh? Yeah, so all in, in the back. Yeah, uh, you spoke about uh, solid, but the solid you present is a gas trap with light field. And I'd like to know, what's the difference for you between this solid and a real solid? Um, so, I, I mean, here the solidification is an interaction induced. So the long range interactions induce a density order. So it's a bit, the, the whole concept is along the line, of course, of, of Leggett's criteria that you have you create in a supersolid a non-trivial density order and the, the off-diagonal long-range order. So in that sense, um, this, uh, the system forms a periodic structure due to the long-range, here almost infinite range interactions. In a real solid, of course, the, the mechanisms the, the, the direct form of interaction is, is different, but I think there are a lot of analogies. I mean, there, there were one, could, one argument can be that, I mean, in the argument in, in our first version of the lattice supersolid, there is breaking a discrete symmetry. And, and the, this two discrete possibility, kind of the modes themselves gave them. Uh, here in this one, uh, where we, we break it continuously along one direction, the only thing that is still given by, by the mode structure is uh, the wavelength of uh, the solidification. But everything else kind of is free along this one direction. 